birds in February. You can find more details on our website, lincolnconservation.org. All right. I'd like to start by introducing um, our two speakers. Ron McAdow is the author of The Concord Sudbury and Alphabet Rivers, A Guide to Canoeing, Wildlife and History, and a similar book about the Charles River. He was executive director of Sudbury Valley Trustees from 20, 2003 to 2013. He lives in Lincoln on Farrar Pond and his current creative work includes writing and illustrating nature-centered stories and songs for children. Gwen Loud has been birding since she was seven and is always learning something new. She's been feeding birds at her home on Conant Road since 1968. Professionally, Gwen taught science at Ten Acres School in Wellesley, and before that ran the environmental education program in the Lincoln Public Schools. Gwen writes a monthly column for the Concord Journal and the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust, and she is a trustee of the Land Trust. Um, I'd also like to note here that all the photos you see are, are Ron and Gwen's respectively. And a little plug for Ron, he has this Thursday, I believe, he's doing a, a program for SVT. So if you're interested in that, you can go to Sudbury Valley Trustees website and register for that. All right, without further ado, let's, let's dive in. And our first question is, why do you feed birds? Um, Gwen, would you like to start? Uh, sure. So I have to admit that the main reason I feed birds is for my own enjoyment. And I should say my late husband, Rob, um, also loved watching the birds too. So we, you know, just get um, tremendous pleasure out of watching all the activity right outside the kitchen window, watching the behavior, <laughs> all the different species that come to the feeders. Um, and I do feel that by watching, watching birds at feeders is a way that many, many people get um, kind of get into nature observations. Um, and of course, I know the birds like it too. And I only have to watch the blue jays chowing down sunflower seeds at a tremendous rate, um, or the woodpeckers going through the suet nonstop to realize that they do enjoy this food, but they don't actually need it. I think it does help them get through some really tough days in the in winter weather. My response would be uh, similar to Gwen's that uh, I feed birds because it, uh, it helps me feel connected to them, which is brings me a lot of pleasure. My wife says, if you feed birds, you always have motion in your yard, which is, is a nice point. I, I uh, agree that birds, as, as a species, the birds don't uh, need us to feed them. Uh, you can't help, though, when you look at their tiny little bodies and you think about the cold nights that they spend out of doors, and you realize that, uh, that some of them get through the winter based on, on the food. That's there, too. So just as a quick follow-up, do birds that visit the feeder lose the ability to find wild food or is it just a, a nice treat supplement? Ron, that's you, right? Uh, birds uh, do not lose the ability to find their own food. David Sibley in his, in his uh, great new book out this year, uh, what it's like to be a bird. He says uh, that birds, no, that no bird is that more than fifty percent of their diet is, is is from feeders. So they're they're out there foraging uh, at the same time, and I think instinctively balancing their nutrition, and they do not lose their ability to uh, forage. And I I would agree. And really, right outside your window. Um, you can see them eat, maybe after they've finished eating a seed, you know, you might find a chickadee kind of peering under a little piece of bark. And that, mm -hmm. could be, you know, it could be finding insect eggs. I mean, they're, they're constantly looking for food everywhere, not just at the feeders. That's great. All right, moving on to our next question. We'll start with Ron. What kind of feeders do you have and what kind of seed 
or other food do you put in them? Well, this, th this slide shows um, my tube feeder, which is uh, uh, outside our kitchen window. I fill it through that little window on the left. And you can see that the cord goes up to the, the pole and then it goes uh, down through a pulley to uh, where it's attached to the house. So if I open the window down at the bottom, I can, uh, I can untie the uh, feeder and then I have a pole and a hook and I reach out and pull it in the window and then I, I can fill it. It's, it's very high off the ground that the, the, the basement is at ground level there. So it's out of squirrel reach and it's even out of bear reach if we ever had a bear come around, which I don't think we have had yet. Uh, once in a while, the squirrels climb a tree near it and they look at it longingly. It's sort of like their holy grail. They know, they seem to know what's in there, but uh, they, then they go back down and, and they benefit from all the seeds that the birds scatter out from the feeder themselves. Uh, on the right, you can see how the feeder looks from my window. So that's the tube feeder. Uh, next slide. This is a, a new project. You know, we've got this COVID winter to deal with. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice as I sat in my study, which is the, the window at the uh, upper right there, if I had a little platform feeder where I could just look out and see my uh, these beautiful, lively creatures. And so I installed a, a platform feeder with a, a perch on it. And <clears throat> um, I think the next, yeah, this is, so if I look out my window, I see uh, this is a mixture of, of black oil sunflower seeds that I feed. And it's uh, uh, dried mealworms that I mix in that the, the birds like. And you can see for a perch and kind of a shelter, I have a piece of what is essentially driftwood. It's a, a rotted stump. The, the object on the left side, the white thing is a, just a, a foam container that came in an electronic device. But I use it to put the, the dried mealworms are so lightweight that they blow away. I really, this, this platform feeder gives me a, a real, uh, as I hoped, it, it gives me a real sense of intimacy with the creatures. You can go to the next slide. This chickadee is, uh, I've, they, some birds will, like finches, will sit at the feeder and they'll just uh, eat, eat them at the feeder. But the other birds that don't have those kind of jaw tongue apparatus to open and extract the, uh, the nut from the seed, uh, will fly away with it. And so a titmouse and a chickadee, that's, they'll fly away. Well, this titmouse just hopped up on the perch. And you, so to be able to see exactly how it holds the seed and how it works on it, it's a pleasure. The last uh, a kind of food I offer is suet in a, one of the wire boxes that hangs uh, near the window and uh, a, this is a downy woodpecker, one of our familiar feeder birds on the right side feeding on the, on the suet. I also though wanna call your attention to the maple leaf decal at the, yes, thank you. Uh, that is there to keep to a minimum bird window collisions. That's the, you can, uh, I bought that at, at uh, the, the Audubon shop at Drumlin Farm, a set of, of leaves that I applied and, uh, because we certainly don't want to be doing any harm. Gwen? So um, these are um, my feeders on Conant Road. You can see they're uh, very close to the house, which makes for easy observation. And um, it doesn't take, it's not that hard to get out and fill them, even after a snowstorm. There's not that much shoveling to do. Um, so let's just start on the left here. So that's um, a pole feeder filled with black oil sunflower seed. And this year for the first time, I'm having to take the top off each night at dark and bring it into the kitchen. And I'll tell you why later, but maybe you can guess. Um, moving to the right, there's another um, tube feeder hanging. And that also is filled with black oil sunflower. 
Um, all these feeders are hanging from a wire, which Rob put up years ago. And for some reason, the squirrels don't crawl across the wire. I think that's because they just get plenty to eat from seeds on the ground. Anyway, so that's black oil in that tube feeder. Then moving to the right is a little, um, a small suet feeder that takes one of those square cakes. Now it's hard looking against the window, there's all this reflection, um, but there's, let's see, there's a feed, that's it, that's it, Bryn. So that is a thistle feeder. And that's been quite busy this, um, this winter so far with pine siskins and gold pinches. And then there's one little tiny hanging one, which um, is, I put mealworms in that sometimes, though I have a better mealworm arrangement, which you will see in a minute. And you can see the kitchen table right inside. Okay, now, um, so the left-hand photo is basically a different view of the same feeders. Thistle feeder on the right, um, and then the, the suet cake, and then black oil on the left. And I have to fill the, the, the black oil sunflower, I'm filling almost every day. And the suet cakes, I'd say once every three days. Okay, moving over to the right, still close to the house. So this is um, obviously a hanging feeder and it's right in front of my study window. I mean, needless to say, it's very hard to get much work done, either sitting at the kitchen table or at my desk because there's all this activity outside. So um, luckily nobody's calculating my time. And all right, so on the left is another suet um, feeder. And this, is, this contains suet that I get at the grocery store. For instance, at Donnellan's, it's in the freezer case right across from the fish. Um, and this is something that the butchers have chopped off meat. And the woodpeckers really love that, but not just the woodpeckers. So when the woodpecker drops little pieces of suet onto the wall below, all kinds of other little birds like juncos and bluebirds um, come and peck off the little tiny pieces, which is great. It's a little misleading. That curved branch looks like it's touching the feeder, but it's, it's not. The feeder is just hanging loose. And the reason, the, so the next photo that looks like a birdhouse, um, it is a birdhouse, but um, of course nobody's living in it now, except maybe a woodpecker to shelter overnight. That little plastic box on top of the birdhouse is where I put dried mealworms. And the bluebirds love those in the winter. Um, so do a lot of other things like blue jays, titmice, et cetera. I used to have an, a so-called official mealworm feeder, but once a bluebird got stuck inside, so I said, forget that. And so I go with this system, which has its drawbacks because of course I have to take the water and snow out and so on. But that's what I do. All right, just a couple more quickly on the left. Um, you can see there's quite, quite a lot going on here. So two squirrels on the ground. I forgot to mention that I scatter mixed seed on the ground, um, both in front of the kitchen and under this feeder. And so the squirrels love that. So do all kinds of ground feeding birds like doves and sparrows and um, cardinals and juncos. And if you, if you look carefully, you can see a red dot in that bush. And that is a cardinal, a male cardinal waiting. Um, the, the blue jays are waiting. There's probably another blue jay on that feeder. Um, but you can see that, that there's a bush there. And so a lot of birds really like having a place to perch near the feeders so that they can kind of observe when to go to the feeder or they can carry a seed from the feeder back to the bush. So um, that's, I think that's one good arrangement here. And on the right, I really just showed this um, goldfinches on the thistle feeder because um, you probably know that goldfinches, the males go through a dramatic plumage change as they um, turn to breeding plumage in the spring. And it's really fun starting I'd say in February to watch some of your goldfinches and that those yellow feathers begin to come in. So by, you know, by May or June, they look almost like canaries with black wings. The females um, still sit, stay olive. 
And then Quinn, just one follow-up question. Where do you buy your supplies, your, your bird seed? Oh, okay. Well, um, I've been buying, in recent years, I've been buying my black oil sunflower seed at Agway because they have a big sale um, in November. So, you know, I just brought home 200 pounds of black oil sunflower seed. And um, I store some of it in metal trash cans, um, which you have to be able to secure so uh, raccoons don't get in. I can tell you more about that later. And thistle seed, I think I bought at Agway. I mean, you can buy seed so many places, hardware stores, um, even the grocery store. Um, I've been buying my mixed seed, the, the stuff that I scatter on the ground at Audubon, because they sell their songbird mix um, does not have the filler. So I, I learned a couple years ago that, that some of that sort of cheaper mixed seed that you can buy, um, you know, for not much money, um, contains filler called Milo, red and, and white Milo, which is really just junk. So I, for my mixed seed, I like to go to the Audubon shop. That's great. All right. So we're moving on to our next question about any problems you've had with your bird feeders. And Ron, would you like to start? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in the middle are the uh, the squirrels. If you if if you have a feeder that the squirrels can reach, they will they will find it and they will sit there and uh, chow down. <clears throat> but you can use predator guards or very or or there there are feeders that will uh, spin around if the squirrel's weight gets on them and so there are amusing ways of dealing with squirrels and and people have <laughs> their own even more amusing ways. I I I haven't had a problem with squirrels in my current setup, but I certainly did in the past. The uh, Gwen Gwen recommended a metal trash can to store your seeds. And I can say that when it, it, at first I thought that a plastic trash can would be uh, good enough, but the rodents can get into it. And one night in the dark, I went out to my plastic trash can and I to, to fill my feeder and I reached in and a mouse ran up my sleeve. And so for a, quite a few long seconds, I was wearing this mouse inside my coat. Uh, so that that was that qualified as a problem with my bird feeder. And Gwen? Uh, well, yes. So raccoons, and you can see that big fat raccoon, which is fat from eating all my sunflower seed, um, managed to take the top off that metal trash can and uh, get into the seed. So um, thanks to my friend Norm Levy, he. Um, you know, told me about some kind of metal strap that you can put over um, a trash can. And so that's what I'm using now. And so far the uh, raccoons have not gotten into it. However, uh, the raccoons have um, gotten into my pole feeder. So remember I told you I had to take the whole top part off every night. And that's why, because I found it uh, this fall knocked over a couple of times, the whole thing knocked over. And I wasn't, you know, I'm okay with feeding the squirrels on the ground. I'm not okay with feeding the raccoons. I suppose you could say that's prejudice, but anyway, I have respect for the raccoons. And the, my, my uh, method with squirrels is evident in the picture on the right. And just a quick follow-up for Gwen. Do you, um, do you see hawks um, attacking birds at the bird feeder or is that not an issue? Oh uh, yes, it is an issue. Um, I seem to have Cooper's hawks um, come through the feeding area pretty often. Now, I'm surprised it has not been a problem so far this winter. And the reason I'm surprised is because two pairs of Cooper's hawks um, had nests and raised young successfully within um, half a mile of my house each direction. So I was kind of worried about that. But anyway, I'm sure as the winter progresses, I will see the Cooper's hawks more often. I would say they fly through um, that when I see them, maybe three times a week. And I have had the um, experience of watching a Cooper's hawk 
demolishing a downy woodpecker sitting on a branch pretty much in front of me. And that was a, that was a hard moment because, you know, my sympathies were with the downy woodpecker, but then I think, wait a minute, the hawk has to eat too. So um, yeah, that's nature, nature in the raw. So hopefully when the Cooper's hawks catch something, um, they'll take it away out of my view. <laughs> All right, we're uh, while we're on that oh. topic, Cooper's hawks are in the the group of hawks that are uh, adapted for preying on for capturing and preying on birds. More common and more often seen by far here are the red-tailed hawks, the the big uh, hawks that that will perch by roads and in our yards. Uh, Gwen, do you? It's I have seen, I've had, I think that I've had, I think that red tails occasionally prey on a bird, but I think I've had them perched near my feeder or not in, in my yard and have the, the small birds well aware that they're there and not be alarmed by them. Do you, uh, would you distinguish between your Cooper's hawk and, and the, and the uh, uh, a red tail in terms of, uh, uh, of a hazard at the feeder? Uh certainly in my experience, the red tails have, I've only seen them in, near the backyard um, a handful of times. Mostly they're out over the fields nearby, probably more likely catching, you know, voles and, and mice. Um, so yeah, I mean, the red tail are, is the hawk that we see most commonly around Lincoln or if you're driving along the highway, for sure, but Cooper's, um, are adept at flying fast and through um, through woods and by feeders and sharp-shinned as well. They're very similar to Cooper's, um, a little bit smaller generally. And I've I've identified my hawks, so-called my hawks, as as Cooper's. But when so I would say at least once a day when I glance out the window, I see that the birds or even the squirrels are frozen absolutely still, wherever they are, on the feeder, on the ground. And that tells me that there must be a hawk overhead. I mean, they pick up right away and they don't want to move, you know, at all because it might attract the hawk. So I think there's a lot, a lot more hawk activity probably going on than I know because I'm not looking out the window all the time. That's great. Um, all right, our next question is, what birds are you seeing at your feeders this time of year? Um, Ron, would you like to start? Well, the tube feeder on the right is being visited in this picture by a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, a, a quick note, when, when people see this woodpecker, unless they've uh, familiarized themselves or kind of looked into the bird situation, they will call it a red-headed woodpecker because it has a bright, lot of bright red on the head and it's very showy. It also has some very subtle or relatively subtle red down here on, on the belly. And uh, that's how it got its name. <clears throat> the red-headed woodpecker is another creature. So the red-headed woodpecker here is representing our resident birds, the ones that I'm going to see in my yard all year long. And those would be chickadees, titmice, white-breasted nuthatches, and, uh, downy woodpeckers, <clears throat> and uh, red-bellied woodpeckers. And on the left, you see a, a, a representing the winter visitors, a, a red-breasted nuthatch. This is, uh, some years we don't see them, but some years, like this year, a lot of them have come from the north and are are visiting our feeders and uh, uh, with their cl their close cousins, the white the white breasted nuthatches. The other birds that come down from the north, the most familiar one is the junco, which uh, once in a while a junco actually comes to a tube feeder. They certainly will come to platform feeders, but more often I think of them being on the ground underneath the feeder. So uh, all of those are the, the birds that are here now. And then in the spring, uh, uh, we look forward to in early May, we can't wait for the first day we see a rose-breasted grosbeak. 
and at that time the um, <clears throat> the the winter visitors have gone. Uh, once in a while, we get other unusual visitors. On the right is a purple finch. You know, see that there's not a speck of purple on that bird, but it's a it's a either a female or a young of the year purple finch, very marked uh, the way it is. And then on upper left is a <clears throat> a pine siskin. These these photographs were taken during that October snow or right after that October snow that we had. Uh, when suddenly uh, th these birds showed up. I haven't seen them since, uh, but they are like the rose breast, uh, like the red breasted um, nuthatch. They're examples of birds that will appear occasionally in the winter, some years more than others. All right, Gwen. Um, okay, so here, well, I should say that, 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 of course, I get basically the same birds that Ron gets at his feeder and probably all of you do too. Um, of course, it's always fun to get something special and unusual. Um, on the left, I, I showed this picture, even though it was taken um, in the summer, because it's a nice comparison of the hairy woodpecker on the left, which is larger, and the downy woodpecker on the right. And those two are very, very easy to confuse. Um, the downy is smaller. You probably know that the male woodpeckers have a red dot on the back of the head. And it basically just takes a lot of experience looking at hairies and downies. So you can confidently say, oh, that's a hairy, or oh, that's a downy. But downies are, are much more common at the feeder. And then the right, let's see, what is that funny thing? Okay, that, that is, that's a red fox that I had um, visiting, drinking from an, a low um, bird bath for uh, quite a few days, a few weeks ago. And um, I was worried about this fox. I think it had mange and I haven't seen it now for about, for a couple of weeks and I feel sad about it. I mean, a lot of foxes do have mange. It affects their fur. And this one was also limping a little bit. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that um, sometimes other things come to the feeding area. Oh, and I, I want to add that just in the past couple of days, I have had something um, less common, something called a white crowned sparrow, which you could look up in your bird book. Mm. But you know, I suddenly looked out at these white-throated sparrows on the ground and I said, wait a minute, there's something different about that one. So, um, you know, feeding birds and watching them, um, it helps if you kind of look very carefully sometimes. That's great. Um, Gwen, would you like to talk a little bit about these pictures? Uh, sure, so the, the bird bath on the left, um, was made by um, somebody we knew. So it's kind of one of a kind. And I feel like I should hang a little towel or something on the, on the perches. But I, I show it here because it has a heating element. So um, uh, my husband, Rob, had an electrician come and install um, an electric outlet and then a, which leads up to, to the base of this bird bath. And so in the winter, we can plug in this um, bird bath heater. And I, I got this at Drummond Farm and um, it really works. So on freezing cold mornings, there's no ice in the bird bath. Uh, birds need to drink year round. So if you can possibly do something like this, um, that's great. And Ron, these, these are yours on the right, right? Yes, yeah, Betsy and I bought this, uh, uh, what we consider very beautiful stone bird bath. I, I would gave it to ourselves for a, an anniversary present or something, but we've had a huge amount of pleasure from it. You can see on the lower right, uh, a male Baltimore Oriole having a vigorous bath. There's something about watching the birds splash and splash and make that water fly and the way they interact at the bird bath that, uh, that uh, is awfully nice. The very first time it was used was, we, it was very late 
it was in December when we installed it and put water in it. And I assumed that nothing would happen until spring, but no, the birds bathe in the winter also. So looked, looked out the window and there was a chickadee having a bath in December. And, and I have to say the birds are really dirty. I mean, so for instance, that I have to clean that bird bath on the left in the summer, you know, I should clean it every day. I mean, those robins, cat birds, by the time they flap around in there, yeah, you know, it's dirty, they need soap. That's great. And then just to, to sort of wrap it up, could you recommend some great resources for folks who might be starting out identifying birds or more advanced resources? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll just talk about this poster, which is one that I happen to have because I participate in a citizen science project called Project Feeder Watch, which any of you could do, um, just go online. And they, they put out these very nice um, posters of feeder birds. Because, I mean, frankly, if, especially if you're beginning at bird identification, mm -hmm. to start thumbing through the whole bird book to figure out what's at your feeder is, can be kind of overwhelming. So I like this particular chart because it narrows down the field a lot to the birds that are likely to be at your feeders, as it says, Eastern feeder birds. Ron, would you have something to add? Um, no, I don't think so. The, uh, <clears throat> the, these, these kinds of posters that show the common feeder birds are are great uh, because you don't have to use the whole field guide, but you might, uh, if you're interested in <clears throat> uh, uh, learning about birds, flipping through the field guide and uh, becoming familiar with the different groups of birds uh, is, is a, a valuable a way to start learning about them. That's great. Um, so I think we have time to show a few extra photos. This is um, the nest. This nest box looks a whole lot like the one Gwen showed, and it's in uh, my yard. <clears throat> you can see it that a wire is coming down from it. The wire is connected to a tiny little camera that's up in the upper corner of, and it's it's sold for this purpose as a nest cam, and it it works remarkably well. The uh, <clears throat> the wire goes down and runs uh, under the sod and runs into the kitchen, into my kitchen. And in the spring, I plug it into a TV. So then I can see what's in the box. Now, last spring, uh, Gwen also mentioned that woodpeckers will, will roost in these nest boxes. And I had a downy woodpecker that was in the habit of the, in the late winter, at least, when I started watching of being in the nest box. But then the chickadees started building a nest in it and getting ready to nest. And the, the winter roosting of the woodpecker and the spring nest building of the chickadees overlapped. So it was very funny to see the chickadee kind of waiting up on top, tapping its feet for the, the uh, uh, downy to uh, vacate so that it could. So um, the chickadee did build its nest and, and, let's, and then we were able to watch it uh, so why don't you go to the next slide? <clears throat> it, it had a nice circle of eggs and I was, I, I was able to capture it, uh, the, the first feeding or the, the first uh, a hatch from it of this naked little chickadee. And Gwen and I were wondering what in the world is it doing? And we're not sure what the adult is doing before she settles down. And now look at her shake back and forth. She's opening her flesh underneath has a brood pouch where the, uh, instead of insulating feathers, the, her warm skin is now in touch with those eggs. And she will roll those eggs and take care of them. Of course, she knows exactly what to do for the eggs. But Gwen, I was wondering if maybe the, 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 the adult was trying to feed that brand new hatchling and then it discovered that it wasn't really quite ready to eat yet. And that, that what we saw was a, a, a caterpillar that it, in a few hours it's going to start eating caterpillars as fast as it can get them, but maybe it's not quite ready to get. But we're not sure what, what it is you see in this picture. 
But what we are sure of is you're seeing the very beginning of, of you're seeing the, the nurturing care of an adult bird, a uh, tiny adult bird, and the uh, very first minutes out of its shell of a, of a chickadee to be. That's great, Ron. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing now and uh, we can take a few questions. I see some in the chat already. So if you have questions, please put them in now. Uh, so first question, uh, is millet also nutritionally void like milo or is millet something you can feed to birds? Um, uh, so Tia Penny gave a very wonderful program um, for the land trusts in September of 2019. And she, she talked about this and millet is on the good side. So she said, no problem with millet. Cracked corn is also very good to have in those mixed collections. Great. Um, a question from Sarah, uh, what seeds would you use to attract a rose-breasted grosbeak? Well, rose-breasted grosbeaks love the black oil seed that, that both Gwen and I feed ordinarily and is the commonly used seed. You know, um, I, no, I agree, uh, Ron, with that. I just, I realized, I should have mentioned earlier that um, some of my friends um, prefer to, to serve um, whole sunflower seed. In other words, just the hearts of sunflower. And uh, because that's what that's what the birds want. They just want to eat the part inside. Um, that, of course, is more expensive. Um, and another feature is that hull sunflowers do not make a big mess. So I get a big mess on the on the bricks or on the grass underneath my hanging feeders um, from all that all the shells of the black oil sunflower. Great. Uh, next question from Lynn. Could you talk about bluebirds and what it takes to attract them? Uh, you mean to feeders or just in general? Well, anyway. In, ge in general. Okay, in general. Um, <laughs> oh, there've been whole books written about that. And um, we have some real experts in Lincoln, um, people like Nancy Soulette. Um, <laughs> but I've had uh, bluebirds nesting around our property for, for many years and I think they like um, they like an area that's fairly open, so they can fly down, say, to a lawn and grab um, some kind of insect or cat caterpillar. And they like um, well, you've seen pictures already in this in this program of bluebird houses. Um, there are yeah, there are some different types, and there are definitely threats to bluebirds. I mean, um, house sparrows can um, kill them, go into the box and kill them. And sometimes tree, sp tree swallows compete with them. So it's, um, it's a big topic, but um, if you have a lawn area and some bushes nearby, um, put, up, put up a couple of bluebird houses. In terms of food, uh, uh, my, my place is very marginal bluebird habitat. So some years we've had them nest here and on some years uh, often not here. Depend, I think it depends on whether they can find a good place in a, a more open area, which is what they prefer. I've never been, had them attracted to uh, anything I was feeding. I've been putting out these dried mealworms because I know they love mealworms. And in the when they're nesting, They've come to take mealworms uh, cope, uh, uh, and, and very enthusiastically. So I'm nursing the hope that my, my feeding platform and the mealworms, maybe I get, I'll get a stray bluebird coming in to sample them. But I can't say, oh, if you offer food X, you will attract bluebirds. Or, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I know that other people have had them come to feeders though, right, right Gwen? Well, I get bluebirds at my suet feeder, mm -hmm. um, and they really like those little little tiny pieces of suet that fall down on top of the stone wall. So suet and and mealworms, I was dried mealworms. They seem to like um, right through the winter, but I don't have them every day. You know, they wander around. I'm always thrilled to see them. 
They mm -hmm. love the bird bath too. Great. Um, another question, could you just go over again what seeds are in which type of feeder? Um, so what do you have in your in your hanging tubular feeder and the pole feeder? So um, in the pole feeder and in the hanging hanging tubular, larger hanging tubular feeder, I have black oil sunflower. Then in the smaller tubular feeder, I have thistle seed. And then um, on the, the hanging feeder, which is sort of in front of my study window, that's some more black oil sunflower. The mixed seed I scatter on the ground. And um, well, the suet is in special suet feeders. Great. And the only seed that I offer is black oil seed, but because I'm not quite as ambitious uh, a feeder as, as Gwen is. Uh, just to follow up on the bluebirds, are, are bluebirds year round residents in this? in Lincoln or do they migrate? So, uh, well, there, uh, I'll let, uh, Gwen has more expertise than I do about this. So I'll, I'll speak briefly to it and then she can uh, uh, fix it. The, uh, <clears throat> it's a, there's a confusing area of birds that might shift south in the winter so that it's possible that the blue, well, there are definitely bluebirds here in the winter. And, and our Christmas count, they're always counted and they, are, they turn up at open areas like uh, Linden Tree Farm here in Lincoln is a good place to see bluebirds in the winter <clears throat> or any time of year. But um, they may not be the very same bluebirds that, are, that will nest here because there may be some shifting. What do you think about that, Gwen? I, I agree completely. And you know, birds that, that <laughs> birds that we call year-round residents. I mean, you know, even some chickadees that we see here in the winter may not just what you said, Ron. They may not actually be the very same ones that we see in the summer. There's a certain there is a certain amount of movement, even among what we call year-round residents. That's very interesting. Um, bluebird. I should just add that bluebirds are a big success story going back to banning DDT, you know, bluebirds were in big trouble, um, sort of back at the time Rachel Carson wrote her book, Silent Spring. And after DDT was banned, um, you know, they began to stage a comeback. So it's really, we need some good news about birds. And that's one of the success stories. Great. Uh, we have a question about barred owls and if they eat birds and if not what they do eat. Well, I'm not aware of barred owls preying on birds, uh, but nature is a, a topic that you can never say, this never happens, or this always happens. It's, uh, you're gonna get in trouble if you answer that. I will say that what they do eat is uh, uh, small animals. They're not, the, the great horned owls are, uh, are very aggressive, very powerful birds that rule the night. Uh, and a, a barred owl might, maybe it will eat a smaller owl, like a sawwood owl, if it caught it, but mostly they eat um, mice and the small rodents that are around the floor of the forest. Um, Gwen, could you recommend a place where you get your dried mealworms? Um, well, I think you can get them a lot of places. I know Erickson's out in Acton sells them, um, Agway sells them. And um, my daughter ordered a big five pound bag of mealworms. That's a lot of mealworms from Amazon, <laughs> you know, Amazon. So, um, but support your local store if you can. <laughs> um, I mean, so Rob, Rob and I used to raise live mealworms and, um, you know, the birds like that too, but that that was quite a bit of work and it got a little smelly. <laughs> so <laughs> dried, I'm going with dried for now. Uh, question for Ron, do you have problems with squirrels on your platform feeder? Do they, do they climb up? Excellent question. It's an open question in my mind. I, uh, will the squirrels show up there? I have hypothetically this answer, uh, this solution to it. If they if they do start coming to the 
uh, my the roof of my my porch. Um, <clears throat> I only put out small amounts of food at a time. So it's not like I'm hanging out, you know, pounds of, of seed. It's just whatever I put out and I have to do it several times a day. I would just, uh, uh, they would they would get what was there and then I would wait and see. How it could end up being a prohibitive problem for, for my platform feeder. Uh, all, so far, so good. That's all I guess. Uh, a question, do you feed hummingbirds? Yes. <laughs> and and so do we. And I saw that Jeffrey Collins asked that question. I don't, hi, Jeffrey. Uh, the, um, it, we're just, Gwen and I agreed to focus mostly on what we're feeding uh, right now at this season. But when May comes around, uh, so do the, you know, we only have we're so impoverished here in New England, we only have, or in, in east of the Mississippi, we only see one species of hummingbird, the ruby-throated, but they are fantastic and we love to see them. And they come, uh, they come to the feeder, but also they do, they're all over the flowers and it's wonderful to see the hummingbirds. And another question from Jeffrey, I think you saw this too, Ron. The saw wet owl in the Rockefeller set a Christmas tree any comments on that? Thoughts? <laughs> well, <clears throat> that was a delightful story, wasn't it? Uh, and that that and that the world responded to it. We're all looking for good news these days, and so that was fantastic that they were able to rescue the sawwood owl and uh, have it rehabilitated. They it ate a lot of mice, and then they they released it. So that's fantastic. Uh, at Drumlin Farm, as as I haven't participated in it, but as I understand it, it's become a big thing to uh, ban sawwood owls by putting out mist nets and and uh, catching them, so that you know the banding helps us understand the the behavior of the birds and uh, their lifespans and their travels and so on. And it, but the thing is, it turns out that these tiny sawwood owls. There are far more of them around than we're aware of. They're just not something, I mean, one reason why birding as a nature study is, is convenient and popular is that birds are active in the day like we are and, and it's light out and you can see them. But the nocturnal owls, which is most, most of them are mostly nocturnal, um, not so easy to observe. And the sawwets are very secretive and tiny. And yes, sawwets are our smallest owl in Massachusetts, and they are, um, they're here year round, um, but we don't see them very often um, or hear them, because as Ron said, they're very secretive, um, but they're also migratory. So the, the banding at Drumlin Farm, which did not happen this year because of COVID, um, is generally mid-October to mid-November. The other small owl we have is the screech owl. And one time when, when I worked at Sudbury Valley Trustees, behind the office there, I was, I was tramping in, in fresh powdered snow. And I saw a place that was poked, 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 poked by feet. And, uh, and then the, the prints, the beautiful prints of the wings beside the, the footholds all around. And uh, I'll never know for sure what was doing that, but uh, I, but in my imagination or my belief, it was a screech owl had could hear under the snow um, uh, mice or, or or other little uh, rodents moving around, and it was it was trying to catch them by, under the snow by by sound and leaving its wing prints in the snow. That's great. Uh, we have a a few more minutes for questions, so if you have any last questions, please type them into the chat. Uh, we had one question from Janet, uh, which you, you partially answered. Do you stop using your feeders in the summer? And I'll add to that, do you, do you change what you put in them in the summer? Well, um, I will say that I um, feed hummingbirds in the summer. I just have one hummingbird feeder and you know put um, sugar water in that. You don't have to buy you don't have to buy special sugar water. You can make your own. Um, it doesn't have to be red. Um, the feeders itself is generally red. Um, of course, 
the best thing for hummingbirds is to plant flowers that the hummingbirds like. Um, and I'm not totally consistent with this, but very often I leave one um, tube sunflower feeder up in the summer for the bird that Ron already mentioned, especially the rose-breasted grosbeaks. I mean, they are so beautiful, the males especially, um, right there at the kitchen window. Um, but I, I, you know, stop feeding any scat mixed seed on the ground, um, take down the pole feeder. So it's much less in the summer. I don't offer suet in the summer. I, I just feed the black oil seed though I go right through the summer, but the demand goes way down. In May, when, when we have so many insects and, and we, we root for those insects, if we didn't have all those insects, we wouldn't have all these birds. Uh, so uh, when we're talking about spraying or insecticide, uh, insects are good. They, uh, uh, the, anyway, when, the, when there are lots of insects, the demand for the, the seed goes way down. They, I, don't, I don't know that there are any species of birds that would feed uh, sunflower seeds to try to raise their babies. They know that the babies need uh, uh, lots of protein and, and so they're, they're taking insects to them. Great. Um, do you see pileated woodpeckers come to the feeder at all? A man told me that he had had luck with a suet feeder that was attached to a tree uh, uh, attracting Pileated woodpeckers. If you don't know, pileated woodpeckers are the the enormous, crow-sized, uh, fantastically colorful woodpeckers that have become uh, almost abundant. You might say they've they've been doing very well because our forests have matured, uh, and so there are lots of big trees around for them. Uh, I so of course I I had to attach a suet feeder to a tree and keep an eye on it. And I didn't see a single pileated woodpecker come to mind. Have, have you been able to get any pileated, Gwen? No, and I keep hoping. Um, the closest I've come is to have, um, well, the pileated woodpeckers come right not that far from the house. Hmm. Um, you know, several, you know, not that, not that infrequently really, but once I had, um, a pair of pileated, pileated woodpeckers in my compost. <laughs> that was pretty weird. <laughs> well, they've never come to my compost, but outside, and, and we have a, a, a fairly mature sassafras tree. You know, you think of them as little tiny trees, but they can get reasonably big sized. And I saw this commotion in the sassafras one summer day. And as I studied it, it turned out to be multiple pileated woodpeckers feeding on the berries of the sassafras. I didn't know they would eat berries. I didn't know that sassafras made berries, but there they were. As long as those berries lasted, pileateds came to that tree, but that was in the summer, but that was nothing that I created on purpose. Yeah. Well, great. when I was growing up, um, pileated woodpeckers seemed like birds of the wild, distant, remote forest to me. Um, but I've learned differently, or the woodpecker, that is, that is not what they're like. And I had one um, big lesson of this. Um, when I was walking um, in the 4th of July and the parade was over. So I was walking from, you know, along Pierce Park down towards center school. Um, and there were people on both sides of Lincoln Road. Lo and behold, there was a pair of pileated woodpeckers on either side of a trunk of a large maple tree on a house right there, um, you know, near near the old town hall exchange. So, um, and, and then subsequently I saw them in, um, in Washington, DC, in Chevy Chase, DC. So, you know, they, they are not what I thought originally. Uh, question from Allison. Uh, are there birds that you hear more rather than see when you're either at the feeder or out in the woods? Well, um, I have age-related hearing loss. <laughs> so uh, uh, I hear less and less every day, but but the, the, the short academic answer would be yes, for sure. And uh, the, the and I am not competent to do this, but but uh, the 
a group of avid or uh, ornithologists, either amateur or, or not amateur, will do nesting studies by going out in the very pre-dawn hours and uh, only using their ears to locate, to find out what birds are breeding in a, in a certain area. And they, they have trained to be able to recognize those songs and calls. And, but the, the, those birders have a motto, the, uh, a bird heard is as good as a bird seen, uh, but not by me. <laughs> well, I would say that um, definitely, especially once the leaves come out, I mean, a lot of birding is birding by ear and that's a whole big topic in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanna see, see if I can make this work for you. A bird that you might hear in the winter maybe more than you would see it, is the Carolina Wren. And the Carolina <laughs> Wren is a small, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. It's a very, it's a fairly small bird, very perky. It comes to my suet a lot. And it has a really loud call, like most wrens. So I'm gonna try playing it. I don't know if it'll work on this Zoom, but here's a song. I'm using the Sibley app. Uh, let's see here. You hear that? Yeah. Yes, we, and it's it's amazingly loud for the size of the bird, but that goes with its personality. They've okay. been coming to that platform feeder, so I've had a good chance to watch them relate to their neighbors, and they are not very nice. They they have a long beak, and so even though they're so small, they intimidate the other other birds uh, uh, who, uh, except for the the, the nuthatches that also have a long beak. But that Carolina wren does not want any chickadees or titmice on that feeder. When it's there, it'll go after them. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, we we did have a few more questions, but I, I wanted to wrap this up by eight because I know I know folks are. Oh, one more, a couple comments that you guys can read on the chat. Well, Ron and Gwen, thank you so much. This was really fun and informative and. So glad you could both get on and share your expertise. Um, and I think if, if anybody has any questions after the presentation, um, you could be, feel free to email Gwen or Ron, um, either directly or through me. Um, if you guys are willing, I can share your email or contact information um, with the wrap up. So, all right, thank you everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>